And now, folks, it's time for Who Do You Trust? Hubba, 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 money, money, money. Who do you trust? And that in itself is the biggest question when it comes to COVID-19 and the coronavirus in America. Who do you trust? Who can you trust anymore with so many answers being given to so many questions? The biggest question is how could America, the United States, one of the greatest countries in the world, be caught so flat-footed when it comes to the coronavirus, being ready for it medically, also being ready for it socially, when you decide how many people are basically stuck in their houses and how many people simply could not move a single foot because the government had to get involved and stop people from social gathering. It now comes down to the future. What happens from here? The future of how the White House will deal with this when we have further pandemics and epidemics. How the CDC will deal with it. How the FDA will deal with it. How do we then move forward once we learn the lessons of COVID-19? That and a lot more as we begin this special edition of The Man in the Arena. Theodore Roosevelt once said, the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena. I believe there's a hero in all of us that keeps us honest, gives us strength, makes us noble. So that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Seize the day whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends himself in a worthy cause. And I'm going to stay right here and fight for this lost cause. You've got to get mad. I mean plum mad dog man. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. Who at best, if he wins, knows the thrills of high achievement, and if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. I'm going to show you how great I am. Could have been stopped, could have been stopped pretty easily if we had known, if everybody had known about it uh, a number of months before people started reading President, about it. You said you didn't Excuse know. me, excuse me. Uh, before we started reading about it, we could have, it could have been stopped in its tracks. Unfortunately, they didn't decide to make it public, but uh, the whole world is suffering because of it. You did say a few days ago, though, you did have a sense that this was a pandemic that was coming. So why was the United States not prepared with more testing? We were very supplies? prepared. Uh, the only thing we weren't prepared for was the, uh, the media. The media has not treated it fairly. I'll tell you how prepared I was. Uh, I called for a ban from people coming in from China long before anybody thought it was, in fact, it was your network. I believe they called me a racist because I did that. Uh, it was many of the people in the room, they called me racist and other words uh, because I did that, because I went so early. So when you say we weren't prepared, had I let these tens of thousands of people come in from China a day, we would have had something right now that would have been, uh, you wouldn't have even recognized it compared to where we are. How many people have passed away? How many people have died? as of this moment. You could multiply that by a factor of many, many, many. So when you say that I wasn't prepared, I was the first one to do the ban. Now other countries are following what I did. But the media doesn't acknowledge well, that. Well, they they know it's true. They know it's yes. true, but they don't want to write about it. Hi once again, everybody. I'm Ed Berliner, and welcome to another edition of The Man in the Arena. President Donald Trump has spent much of his time blaming others for what has happened in America and around the world, and certainly there, you heard, where he has blamed the media for what they either said or didn't say. It has been a time since the very beginning that COVID-19 was first thought about and first discussed in America where somebody's looking for blame. Let's stop considering the blame here for a moment and consider the fact that we are in an historic moment. Not a good historic moment, but one that many people and many generations will talk about for decades, maybe even centuries to come, when we learned new lessons about how sometimes Mother Nature says, it really doesn't matter what you do as man, I'm going to do what I do, and you're going to have to basically pay the price. But could that price have been ameliorated, and could we have stopped what is happening today? Let's get right to it. I want to welcome in my guest. 
He is an internist and specialist in infectious diseases. He is the chair of editorial, the editorial board at berkeleywellness.com. He is a clinical professor emeritus at the University of California, Berkeley School of Public Health. In other words, he knows more than we do, which is why I wanted to have him come on and explain things today. It is a pleasure to welcome Dr. John Schwartzberg to the show today. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Doctor, when we first look at it and we first consider that indeed question of blame, as a physician looking at something like this and looking at the fact that this is nature at work, do we not as a society have to stop placing blame and start deciding sooner or later, right now, that this was an inevitability and we simply have to deal with the inevitable? Sure. Unfortunately, we, we are a part of nature, and for all of our recorded history, and certainly long before that, human beings have been experiencing pandemics, or at least epidemics. And just in this last 120 years, we've seen some terrific, horrific epidemic, uh, pandemics. The worst one, of course, was the 1918-1919 influenza um, pandemic that conservatively killed about 50 million people on this planet when the population on this planet was much smaller than it is now. And we've experienced more pandemics since then, mostly with influenza, the most recently in 2009. Of course, we had the scare with Ebola, um, which um, should have warned us more than it did. Um, I think that Anybody who looks at the history of infectious diseases in our species and and looks at biology over time understands that this is this is nature and we have to anticipate that this is going to always happen, at least for the foreseeable future, until we develop much better tools. We've been able to um, we knew that after um, the <clears throat> SARS outbreak that there was going to be another pandemic. Um, either of another coronavirus like SARS was or influenza, which I've always been much more worried about. But we knew something was going to happen, and we started to set up things about that in terms of governmental structures and so on. But we badly bungled that in the sense of not funding it adequately um, or at least only sporadically and um, not really taking the warnings that we had from modeling that was done that this was going to be around the corner. When you say getting ready for it and preparing for it governmentally, let's turn to that first, because there's been a tremendous amount of criticism on the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, and the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. There have indeed been a number of mistakes that have been made. And I ask the question here, who screwed up? Is it not fair to say that everybody did somewhere? Because especially when you look at the way that the lab testing went and the way the verification process went and how the kits were malfunctioning. Nobody was ready for this. How could America, the greatest country on the world, but these two agencies be so badly prepared? Well, before addressing that, I want to point out something that will frame that question you have, I think, a little bit better. After SARS occurred, which was 2002, 2003, lasting less than um, less than about nine to ten months, and it was gone. When that occurred, it really ravaged many countries in Asia: China, South Korea, Singapore, Japan, Taiwan. They were really beaten up badly by that. So was Canada in in America, but the United States really was spared a great deal. Those Asian countries that I just mentioned didn't forget that experience. They not only invested in preparedness, but they kept their investment up. So when when SARS-CoV-2, our current pandemic occurred, they were much better prepared than we were. And it's not surprising now when you look at what's happening with SARS-CoV-2 in, in those countries, that they have gotten a handle on it and the numbers are declining, in some cases precipitously. Um, even China, with their draconian policies, um, has remarkably shown 
a dramatic decline in the number of cases. And, and just very recently, just in the last couple of days, they reported for the first time that there were no cases that occurred on Chinese soil unless they were imported. A remarkable achievement. And when you look at Taiwan um, and South Korea, they're on the downslope in terms of the number of cases. Same thing in, in Singapore. So I think that um, we can see what, a, what countries can achieve when they are prepared. The West was not prepared. The tragedy that's going on currently with Italy is just so painful to think about. And when we look at our own country, a lot of this could have been avoided had we been better prepared. Which which then comes down, I guess, to my follow. Was it ignorance? Was it hubris? Was it political bias? Because there has to be a reason why America itself cannot be prepared. And I'm and again, I'm not a doctor. I just play one on TV, and I'm reading many of the articles that talk about how other agencies around the world knew something was coming, and they were on it. We weren't, and we were caught flat-footed. Yeah, there was no reason for us to be caught, caught flat-footed. We were warned by actually governmental agencies that had projections within the last 12 months that there was a pandemic around the corner. You know, the problem with public health is that when you prevent something, nobody experiences it, and so they don't think anything happened. So prevention doesn't get a lot of publicity and doesn't get a lot of funding because it's not visible. Action, when you take action against something that is a problem and resolve it, then everybody's very grateful. But nobody's ever grateful that something was prevented because they never experienced it in the first place. And that's, I think, the attitude that was taken in the United States. Not, um, not consistently, but intermittently, we just stopped putting a lot of effort into preparedness. Let me give you an example. Um, after Ebola and after 2009, the H1N1 uh, pandemic of influenza, um, <clears throat> we, we um, uh, set up a uh, division within the executive branch of uh, prepared uh, pandemic preparedness. And that was a division directed towards addressing any possible pandemic that was around the corner. Um, in the last two years ago, while the uh, division was not dissolved, um, it, um, one of the positions that led it was removed and it was changed in terms of its, uh, who it reported to. So it had less, much less authority than it had in the years preceding that. And had that not happened, I think we would have been a little bit better prepared. And I, I think what we're doing is, if you look at this full screen we have here, that our viewers can see and our listeners will refer to, the last one. Termination of the NSC Pandemic Directorate helped cause the lack of preparedness and severity. Now, there's people in the government, doctor, who are saying, well, wait a minute, that's not true. We were stuck with it. Uh, it didn't happen. It wasn't us. No, it, it, it did happen. But again, it's it's a matter of do we not have to come out, and if we're going to be completely honest, which I want us to be today, and it makes no difference who it hurts or, or who it affects, people looked at it and said, nah, it'll never happen to us. Come on, let, let's get rid of it. It's it's a stupid waste of money, and we can put our money someplace else. It, it, it's, a, it's a bad, it was a bad government decision. Yes, and I don't think it was any... I agree with you. I don't think it was any one person's bad government decision. We know it was a bad decision to not fund it adequately. And when I say it, to not fund preparedness adequately. That was a bad decision. And it wasn't just in the last three years, although it was m worse in the last three years, but it was off and on for the last tw uh, 20 years that we weren't doing what we should be doing. Um, so Certainly, the buck stops with the people who decided not to pay the money to get it done. Also, it's important to recognize that when there's inconsistent and inaccurate leadership, the governmental agencies that report to that leadership don't know exactly what to do, and it leave, gives them mixed messages. So it leads to confusion within those agencies. And that was a big part of the problem. There were other issues, too, within the CDC and the FDA. 
um, some things that, that happened, especially surrounding the testing, which I hope we can get into in more detail, sure. um, that really represented an abject failure of government. And that, that was a problem, not just from the CDC side, but also from the FDA and also from the executive branch. I'm, I'm going to take a moment of levity, but it is not really um, meant to be funny, but it certainly is meant to be very pointed here, where our current administration, during the strike of COVID-19, decided to make this all about one country, and that in itself was incorrect in so many ways, or was it? Here's exactly what was said in the lead-up to where we are today. Corona virus, you know about this whole thing. We have it totally under control. It's one person coming in from China. We pretty much shut it down, coming in from China. The coronavirus outbreak in China. China, you know about where it started. It just shows you what can happen. Everything can be perfect, and then you hear, gee, there's a bug, there's a flu, there's a virus. They didn't know what it was in China. And I said, uh-oh, that doesn't sound good. Who would think that this was going to happen? Mm. You hear? It starts with a problem that they have in China. So let's get this right. A virus starts in China, and the Democrats' single talking point, and you see it, is that it's Donald Trump's fault, right? It's Donald Trump's fault. No. Nobody is blaming us for the virus. Nobody. They're not blaming us. This started in China. Thousands and thousands of cases in China. Coronavirus came from China. The foreign outbreak. The foreign outbreak. The foreign outbreak. A foreign virus. As soon as I heard that China had a problem, I said, what's going on with China? I heard about it in China. It came out of China. Something that came out of China. It started in China. 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 China is obvious what's happened in China. 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 China, 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 China. This came out of nowhere. Let's let's then get to the serious part from the doctor's perspective, because the president was asked why he calls this the Chinese virus, and his answer at a press conference was, "Well, it came from China." Okay, let's give him the benefit of the doubt. From a medical standpoint, is he correct? Well, it came from bats to humans. Um, the first cases reported were in China. Um, that's accurate. Um, it perhaps would have been more appropriate to call this the human virus because it occurred in human beings, regardless of, of what part of the planet it occurred in. You know, if... We forget history very quickly. The, I mentioned earlier the 1918-1919 Spanish influenza pandemic. That's what it was called, the Spanish influenza pandemic. The reason it was called the Spanish flu was because Spain was neutral at that time. It was the only Western country that was neutral. So the Germans blamed it on the Spaniards, the Americans blamed it on the Spaniards, and so on. It had nothing to do with Spain. It actually, and interestingly, the virus probably began in America. So more appropriately, it should have been called the American flu. But frankly, we stopped a long time ago naming these pandemics after the country that the, the virus or bacterium began in. And we, did, we stopped doing that because it made no sense. It began in human beings. It began, most of the time, it begins from animals to human beings. So if you notice, we're calling um, SARS, which occurred in 2002, 2003, doesn't have anything to do with the name of where it occurred from. Uh, MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, refers to a region. That's the last time we've ever named anything after a region. <clears throat> this virus is called SARS-CoV-2. It's not named after a region where it came from. Nobody thinks that way. Well, at least nobody who thinks about these problems really thinks that way anymore. So let's go ahead, before we get to testing, because I know you want to get there, and I want to get there as well. But I brought up a graphic earlier as we deal with 
what's happening in China and how the Chinese seem to be finally getting a handle on this, I wanted to deal with some of the the facts and fictions and just get a short comment from you on, on all of these because these seem to be the most discussed comments. First of all, the virus started with the Chinese tradition of eating bats. True or false? False. Okay. False. It started from bats and somehow it spilled over into human beings, probably through what we call an intermediate host. Um, one of the sus suspects for the intermediate host is a mammal called a pangolin. That's possibly where it came from. We haven't clearly identified the intermediate host yet. The virus would not have happened if not for unsanitary living conditions in China. But the reason why it happened is because human beings are encroaching on areas where live animals live, or we're creating an environment where live animals can be in, in um, close proximity to human beings. So this virus, again, it spilled over from bats to either directly to humans or bats to another live animal that had direct contact with human beings. And as we encroach more and more and more on territory of animals that we don't normally come into contact with, these are the kind of problems we're going to see. Okay, now we've already discussed that COVID-19 is not a Chinese disease. Next up, the U.S. was never in any danger if someone from China had not arrived in America, which seems to me to be mystifying in itself because while we're able to trace it to one individual in Washington state, what about the cruise ships? What about the fact that so many people on the East Coast have wound up with the coronavirus? So I'm going to guess that that is going to be false as well. Well, of course it's false. Um, sure, somebody arriving from, uh, it was an American who arrived from China that brought, brought it to Seattle. Lots of Americans travel to Asia. Lots of Americans travel to China, many, many thousands. And anyone that, it's probably many of them have brought it back here. So the idea of blaming uh, someone from China brought it back here um, in terms of the Chinese did this is, is absolutely absurd. CDC and the FDA were completely ready for such an outbreak. I think we can say we, we've touched on that briefly. No, they were not. And it would seem that they haven't been ready for quite some time. The CDC had has their budget has been dramatically reduced over the years um, relative to the size of our population. They have fabulous people there, excellent people, well-trained, brilliant, but they don't have enough. They don't have the resources. They were running a very efficient ship that was doing okay as long as there was no problem. Mm -hmm. And as long as they had the money, which was taken away from them. The, the next is government plans were in place and ready to go for the size of an outbreak. Can, can we say that even with budgets cut, that there was a plan in place and, and ready to go, but it simply was inadequate because of all these different uh, factions that we're talking about here, money having uh, the pandemic directorate taken away? You can have all the wonderful plans you want, and you can be ready, but if you don't have the money and the wherewithal to do it, you're not really ready at all. Sure, there was, there's, there's pandemic planning, and there's, there's volumes written on this. Uh, but if you look at our response to the pandemic as it, it started to unfold later in January, there was no evidence that there was any plan at all. There's been complete inconsistency in how the national government has approached this. That said, I think there's been fairly good consistency out of a lot of the misses we've received from the Centers for Disease Control. And I think the state health departments have played in a very large role in spite of the fact that they're very underfunded. Let's deal a little bit then with, we talked about the inevitability, we've talked about all the rest. And I wanted to make sure that we got onto this, this issue of, of testing because there's a couple of things here that bother me. And that is this discussion of self-testing. Now, if, if we look at, at being tested and we look at how a physician tests someone for this, the physician knows. But when I hear somebody say that you can basically go out and buy a kit and do it yourself, and I heard somebody, and I'm, I, I want to say that it wasn't government, say, oh, it's just like a pregnancy test. 
do you not as a as a physician have to raise the eyebrow and go really do, do you want to go there it doesn't seem to me like self testing is smart at all no the, the testing the interpretation of the testing is quite nuanced and requires someone with expertise to explain the results secondly the testing that's done that's being advertised that you can get at home has not been approved by the FDA or the CDC. There's no assurance that it's reliable at all. I would strongly caution people not to, not to pursue testing in that regard. But testing is much more complicated. You see that on, on the screen right now, how uncomfortable it is to, well, it's a little uncomfortable, but... Well, yeah, you're basically sticking a swab up somebody's nose, and I can see human beings themselves going, I'm not going to do that. That hurts. Right. It, it doesn't hurt that much, but it is uncomfortable, <laughs> for sure. But but what he just did, he did put that swab in the man's what we call nasopharynx, and he's going to submit it now to the laboratory. What the laboratory is going to look for is the RNA of the virus, the genetic material of that virus. Um, and if it's present, we will say that this man is infected. If it's not present, we will say that at that moment in time, when it was sampled, we could not find the virus there. The virus could have been in another location, let's say further down in his airways, and it wouldn't have been detected in the nasopharynx. Um, if it, it could be that he wasn't producing enough viral particles to identify at that moment in time in that location. The next day, it could be positive. So if you do a home test or you do any test and it's negative on one day, it doesn't tell you that the next day it's not going to be positive. So you see where it's pretty useless. That type of specific RNA testing is not does not have a great purpose in terms of answering the question, am I infected at this moment? Let me tell you where it is very effective. It's effective from a clinical standpoint. If I develop high fever, dry, hacky cough, aching all over, and I'm starting to get short of breath, that's a classical presentation for COVID-19. I'm gonna call and to the emergency room or my physician and the emergency room or the physician is going to send me directly to some place for me to get tested. If I'm positive at that point, they're going to take action on me. If I'm negative at that point and I'm really short of breath, they're going to still take action on me. So the test would be helpful in terms of diagnosing what's wrong with me at that moment. But clinically, the doctors are going to look at me and decide, how much help do I need? Do I need to be hospitalized? Do I need to come in? And will I be needing a ventilator in a few hours? So the testing will give us a diagnosis in that kind of setting, or at least it will help us lead us to a diagnosis, but it's not going to be definitive at any, at any point in time, unless it's positive in the case of a clinical circumstance. Is not one of the most frustrating things to you as a physician and to others is what we hear to this day, we heard from the beginning, and I still see it written. I hear it spoken on podcasts and radio. I see it on television. People say, ah, oh, this is just another case of the flu. Doctor, I, I swear to you, my jaw drops. I, I, I find myself getting short of breath when I hear that myself because I cannot, I understand how human beings can, can think that. But is that not, I'll use the words, I, I don't want you to use the words and, 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 and get upset. Is this not just galactically stupid to believe that this is just the flu? It's not. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's again, it's a complicated issue. For 80% of the people who get infected with this virus, it's not much of a disease. Some, a lot of people, we don't know how many because of inadequate testing, but a lot of people get infected and they don't even know they're infected because they're not sick. And a lot of people within that 80% do get some symptoms, a cough, sore throat, um, maybe a little bit of fever, uh, but not real sick, usually not enough to even pursue calling the doctor. That's 80% of people. It's the other 20% that really do get sick, that need medical attention, and a certain percentage of those folks need to be in the hospital 
a large percentage of those folks. And some of those folks wind up in the intensive care and some of those folks wind up on a ventilator. So what is COVID-19, the disease? It goes has a spectrum all the way from being asymptomatic infection to nothing much more than a cold and a cough to a pneumonia with a fever and you're sick but don't need to be in the hospital to a pneumonia and fever and shortness of breath where you need to be in the hospital to something where without a ventilator support, you're going to die. So it's that entire spectrum of disease. That's COVID-19. Influenza, frankly, is very similar to that in terms of people get very similar a very similar clinical spectrum. It's very difficult to distinguish between the two. The one big difference is that if you look at the mortality rates, the case fatality rates to influenza, and you look at the case fatality rates to COVID, they're at least a log different. That is, this year, the case fatality rate to the influenza that's killed um, 30,000 Americans, somewhere between 20 and 45,000 Americans, it's killed this year. A lot of people, more than COVID so far. Um, the mortality rate to that virus is 0.1% overall. The mortality rate to COVID, taking everybody from the old people to young people all together, is we're not exactly sure what it is, but it's maybe around 1, one to 2%. The number keeps changing every day, but you see that it's either a log of 10 or 20 greater than what influenza is. So it has the it not only has the potential, but it can and does kill much more than influenza does. And it spreads very easily. We see how fast it's spreading. So you see how these numbers are going to add up very quickly in terms of morbidity, that is people being very sick, and mortality. Dr. Salzberg, let's go ahead and talk about treatment here. There is no vaccine. And the doctors who know say, be smart. We may not have a vaccine for 12 to 18 months. That's just the way it goes. Now, the president has recently announced, in conjunction with the FDA, a different drug that is being used. And I wanted to hear from him first, and I wanted to get your opinion on if this is indeed, it's not a miracle drug, but is this at least a step in the right direction? The FDA has approved a compassionate use for a significant number of patients. Uh, we have a drug called chloroquine. Uh, a derivation would be hydroxychloroquine, which I hear even better about. It's a common malaria drug. Uh, it's been available, so therefore the safety level we understand very well. It's been relatively safe. And it showed very encouraging early results really encouraging. If, we, if this works as well as hopefully it might, uh, the FDA, which would have taken normally much longer to do under our uh, uh, great secretary, has been fantastic. The head of the FDA has been Dr. Hahn, Dr. Stephen Hahn. Uh, he's been fantastic. Uh, he got it approved very quickly. I won't even tell you how quickly, but let's put it this way. It's approved. And we're uh, encouraging you to take a look at it. Uh, we have ordered a lot of it, and uh, you can too. It's by prescription. It's a very powerful drug for malaria and also for uh, various forms of very serious arthritis. But we think it has a very serious, uh, very good impact on what we're talking about with respect to the virus. So you'll take a look at that, and you can coordinate with us. But I think, to me, that's a game-changer. As a specialist, then, what you've just heard, what's your reaction? Um, I'm astounded by the President of the United States promoting a drug where there's been no clinical trial for its use yet against this virus. There are, there's, there's a lot of interest in chloroquine, but let me backtrack. There was a lot of interest in the combination drug levonapir and ritonavir. Uh, to treat this because there was what we call in vitro activity of those antiviral drugs against COVID-19. <clears throat> Just yesterday, the results of a trial of, of those two drugs together for sick patients with COVID-19 
showed it was no better than not being treated at all. And there was tremendous enthusiasm about that. We have to do clinical trials to see if a drug's going to work. There has been no clinical trial yet published on the use of hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine. It is being tried, and we have lots of anecdotal reports. It reminds me of when I was, when the AIDS epidemic began, there were lots of anecdotal reports of drugs that people were enthusiastic about, and they turned out, most of them, not to work at all in the early days. And some of them actually caused more harm than good. Of course, I, I think it's appropriate to use hydroxychloroquine, and doctors are doing that to see if it will help. But to make the statement that this is going to be a game changer, um, that's not based upon any. Is, is this just then, as we look at it and hear what the president said, is this just him and others shooting in the dark, doing whatever they can at this point to, to simply try and throw something out there, anything out there, to try and placate a general public and make them think that we're closer to uh, some sort of a cure when there is no shortcut? That would seem what this is. This is just throwing darts in the wind and not having any concept of what will happen in the end. All I can tell you with certainty is that there is no science to back up what he said. If there is no science, and I'm going to trust you because you're the man of science, then why aren't more physicians speaking out about it when we are inundated, not just from the upper echelons of government level, but from other levels as, as, as well as to these so-called magic bullets that are out there. Why aren't they screaming at the top of their lungs saying, no, no, that's not the case. You're not getting it right. You're, you're going to kill people if you do this. Well, let's backtrack a moment. Please. <laughs> the, the way um, chloroquine, which is a drug we've used for ages against malaria, and more recently, in the last few decades, we've been using it to treat hydroxychloroquine to treat rheumatoid arthritis. We've known for a while that chloroquine has some laboratory, again, in vitro, that is laboratory evidence that it's active against some viruses. And there is evidence that in a test tube, chloroquine has activity against SARS-CoV-2, this virus that causes COVID. That's the evidence we have from science. Everything in terms of the its use clinically, we have lots of reports from people who said, doctors who have said, I've used this, my patient got dramatically better. Um, that's, as I said, that's what's called anecdotal reporting. And, it, and it, I'm delighted to see that. But again, We've seen over and over again what anecdotes tell us and what a clinical trial then tells us often are two different things. Let's go ahead and deal then with where we are next in America with the lockdown of this country that have that has changed the society forever. What I found was, was a, a stunning uh, ad, ad admission, if you will, from Francis Collins, the director of the National Institutes of Health, when they asked if the U.S. should impose a total lockdown right now, where even he came out and said it's hard to answer, but in his own words, it would seem that if this were to happen, the American people just wouldn't understand. It's It might not be drastic enough. Do you agree that we are at a point where California has locked down the entire state, but are we looking at that where people are going to have to understand that even though we're told that things might be getting better, that that lockdown might be the only thing that stops this? It might be. Um, I live in the Bay Area, and we've essentially been locked down, what we're calling shelter in place, now for since midnight uh, five days ago. Or, yeah, about that. And um, 
it's not fun. And nobody's going to want to have that happen. But it very well may be the, the way we can stop this if we don't do it voluntarily. The reason why I say that is because this virus is spreading person to person. If I don't get infected, I won't infect someone else. As a matter of fact, we think that the number of people that one person infected will infect is close to three. So I, 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 I want you to say that again, that it's possible that each person who has the virus could infect, on average, another three people? That's, yeah, the number, it's called the r naught, or the, some people may have heard about that, it's the reproductive number, and on average, one person is going to affect about 2.8 people. From your perspective, in the state of Florida where I live, they decided to keep the beaches open for a couple of days <laughs> after we had discussed much of what could happen. When you see the beaches filled with people and partiers and revelers, is the first thing that comes to your mind the amazing Petri dish that's being allowed here and how all of these people may wonderfully think that they're immune, but they're, they're absolutely ignorant to what can happen. And, it, and it, was a, it was a terribly foolish move by the state of Florida, and it puts potentially thousands more people at risk, yes? Actually, the first thing that came to my mind when I saw this was selfishness. People who do this are being selfish because they're putting themselves at, getting, uh, at risk of getting infected, but it's not, as we discussed earlier, if they get infected, they're going to spread it to almost three more people. If, if, they don't, if a person doesn't protect themselves against getting infected, they're just thinking of themselves and not other people. So I think it's a very selfish thing to do. Of course it was uh, ignorant. Of course it was naive. Of course it was very self-centered. It's also very disappointing, but it also illustrates why we need good leadership to get the American people to understand this is a serious problem, a very serious problem, that we have to take care of ourselves and we have to take care of other people at the same time. So then let's deal with what we saw on the beach. Young people, people under the age of 30. And from the very beginning, it would seem as if the message has been sent to these people that, oh, don't worry about it. COVID-19 is only for people who are over the age of 70, then 60, then 50. And then I heard a story about an infant that had been born with coronavirus. And now they are talking about scattered stories I've heard about youth as well, which now brings us to the mutation possibility, which I know happens. And I'm not trying to be science fiction-esque here, but is it not fair to say that to tell young people, you're completely immune, don't worry, you've got fresh lungs, everything's good, isn't that a concern in itself? And isn't that a little ignorant? Because isn't it possible that they can be affected? It's, medicine doesn't pick it by age. Uh, and it, it certainly seems that viruses... Don't go out and see whether you're 16-year-old and healthy or 60-year-old and unhealthy. Sure. The, we've seen in our intensive care units people in their 20s and 30s and 40s, very sick, on ventilators. We've seen some of these people die. It is true. It's very true that the older you are when you get infected, the more likely you are going to die from this. The numbers start to go up precipitously in the later 60s, clearly in the 70s, and in the 80s and after. But that doesn't mean that younger people aren't going to get sick and die, and we do see that. Again, people have to think about this in two ways. They have to think about their own protection to protect themselves from getting sick, and they also have to think about protect if the, the understanding that if they get sick, they can spread it to three other people. And you can see how exponentially that it's going to grow. So there, have to be, there has to be two things in everybody's mind. Protect myself for myself 
and protect myself so that I don't hurt somebody else. You know, you're talking about young people on the, on the beaches of Florida, but I can tell you I'm with young people here in the Bay Area all the time at the university, the undergraduates. I teach masters in public health students and I teach medical students. Those young people are outstanding. They aren't on the beaches. They know how serious it is. So I'm not going to blame. I'm not putting blame on young people. I'm putting blame for this on the fact that they, there has not been good national messaging and consistent. And, and isn't isn't that the messaging word? that consistent messaging is the biggest problem? And that starts at the top and it has to filter down or else you have this conglomeration of messages where the message itself is going to be completely lost. Well, unfortunately, we have um, we've had a situation in this executive branch of the government um, where the messaging has uh, in general. Uh, there's been a lot of um, prevarication. Uh, there's been a lot of non-truths. And even if everything that came out of the administration's mouth now was truthful, who's going to believe it? It's like, you know, growing up, we're always told the story of if you keep telling lies, then when you're going to tell the truth, nobody's going to believe you. So that's, I think, part of the problem we're in right now. I also find part of the problem we're in is is my own business, is the press, the legitimate press, I call it, which is out there every single day trying to get the story right and trying to make sure that they are able to sift through the lies and the, the hyperbole. But then we have what I call the 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 Twitter twits, the, the clickbait media. And I'm going to put Laura Ingram from Fox News right in that with an astounding tweet that I happen to pick up today, which is, hey, Americans need to know the date certain when this will end because it's uncertainty for business, parents, and kids. It's just not sustainable. Doctor, again, galactically stupid on its face, and it, and it leads people to believe in many ways that there's someone out there trying desperately to make sure that this virus holds on. And, and the message itself, people need to find legitimate sources to get their messaging from. We may have hammered them earlier, but as you said, the CDC is still doing great work. And, and I think we have to pay attention to them, people like yourself who do this for a living, who are smarter than us, instead of constantly going to these twits who, and, and I, I said this to you earlier, I'm not a doctor. I just play one on TV and podcasts and radio and and leave leave the smart stuff to you folks, yes? <laughs> well, first of all, my colleagues and I are not smarter than the general public. We're just probably much better informed because that's our job. Okay, I will I, I will then be the one to say that because when it comes to medicine, I'll, I'll let that stand. Please continue. <laughs> sure. And I, I will also say that... Um, Laura Ingram was absolutely right. We do need to know exactly when this is going to stop. Absolutely, we need to know that. But I don't have a crystal ball to tell me that. Exactly. And all of my colleagues who do work in terms of what's called med mo pandemic modeling, they can only approximate, guess, based upon the data we have. And then it's a, the best guess. It's, it's very good, and rigorous scientific work, but... No one knows for sure when is this when this is going to end or how it's going to end. Is it going to be a month? Very unlikely. Is it going to be a year? Distinctly possible. Is it going to come in waves like 1918 and 1919 did? Certainly possible. Is it going to become what we call endemic, meaning part of the background noise and we just experience coronavirus every year like we experience influenza? Nobody knows. Are we, going to, are we immune to it so we can never get it again? If that's the case, then things aren't going to be terribly serious down the road, down the road, um, after everybody's been exposed. But we don't know if our immunity, how long our immunity will last to this. Will it be a month? Will it be a year? Will it be a lifetime? So these are outstanding questions. So to, to make the statement, we need to know as if there's somebody who can answer that, if we were just smart enough, is, is really... Um, it's really bizarre. 
<laughs> which is a good place for us to to come up to a conclusion here and wrap this up, because you mentioned down the road. From the medical standpoint and from your learned standpoint, everything we've talked about here today, from the failure to keep certain branches of government together, from budgets, from leaders in government throwing nothing but hyperbole and fraud at the American public on a daily basis, from the the stories being told, the rumors, the innuendo, all of this. Where do we go from here? What's the smart move for the next moves to make sure that other than just having 20 million masks stuck in every city and certainly eventually finding a vaccine for COVID-19, where do we go from here to make sure that America doesn't get caught so flat-footed next time? Sure. I think the answer to that goes to re-evaluating the model that we're using for our healthcare system. And specifically, let's, let's first look at uh, hospitals. Beginning several decades ago, hospitals adapted the business model to make them more efficient. And now their hospitals are run by lots of administrative people who are very well trained and very good at making hospitals efficient. American hospitals are extremely efficient because it's not efficient to have beds that aren't filled. So we make sure that we have just enough beds to fill the population that needs them. It's not efficient to have stores and stores and stores of equipment and backup drugs. That's not efficient. It's better. It's more efficient to order what you need when you need it. And that is to have a pipeline bringing things in. And all of this makes sense. It makes perfect sense for a company like Amazon, but does it make sense for hospitals? The number of hospital beds we have today, including in intensive care unit beds, is less than we had 20 years ago and 30 years ago, because we're much more efficient today. So I think we have to, and we'll use hospitals as just an example of the American health system in general. So I think we have to reevaluate: do we want just a very efficient healthcare system specifically hospitals, or do we want a system that has the play in it, the reserve that can accommodate when things go wrong? Because as when we began the show, we were talking about the fact that things are going to continue to go wrong. We are going to see pandemics reoccur. But if we had play in our system this time, if we knew we had enough ventilators to accommodate whatever would happen, if we knew we had enough ICU beds, if we knew we had enough hospital beds, there wouldn't be the panic that, that is occurring right now. You've heard a lot of talk about the flattening of the curve. Everybody talks about that. What that's about is to prevent this surge in cases that's going to exceed the number of beds we have in hospitals and the number of ventilators we can put people on. If we can have the same number of people get sick over six months as we had, as would get sick over one month, we could perhaps accommodate all those people. If we had enough hospital beds going into this problem, we wouldn't have to worry as much about this issue. But let me say one other thing about preparedness. Besides re rethinking about how we, um, how we, how we, uh, how we look at efficiency for hospitals, we have to have a society that um, assures that everyone gets cared for. We need to make certain that people are, are not going to avoid seeing a doctor because they're sick. We have to make sure that if somebody gets sick, that terror that if they wind up in the hospital, who's going to put food on the table for their family is not there. Those are issues that we need to really grapple with as a society, where there's trust between the individual and the rest of society, that is the government and society, where there's a trusted relationship. If we had that, that would go a long way to dealing with how people react to these kind of problems. We have to have a system that assures that people aren't going to go to work if they're sick. Nobody wants somebody to be sitting next to you coughing, but people have to go to work when they're sick if they don't have sick pay. So there are a lot of policy issues that go into this that doctors are not particularly good at. I'm certainly not an expert in, but there are a lot of policy decisions that people need to make to address these kind of issues. So when you talk about how can we be better prepared, 
Yes, we can have more doctors and more nurses and more respiratory therapists. Yes, we can have hospitals that have much more play in them. But we need an entire system of care all the way from the work situation to health insurance to take make sure people are cared for. It's interesting how we didn't plan this, but we started the show with the word trust. And I just 60 seconds ago heard you use the word trust, which once again is the possibly the single biggest lesson that we will learn from all this. I I only wonder if indeed there are those who will learn or simply just set it aside in favor of simple things like greed and arrogance and denial. And I, I thank you for also mentioning yeah. the, the health care workers because, my God, we didn't even have time to talk about them. But the frontline workers who are out there who are putting their health on the line every single day uh, to be a part of this are the people that we need to applaud uh, for the work that they do. Dr. Schwartzberg, I want to thank you so much for spending the time. It has been enlightening. I know that our audience is going to be enlightened. I hope that they all consider just doing the simple things that it takes uh, to make themselves safe and realize that sooner or later it'll all end, uh, we'll all be back to a normal life, but then again, things will absolutely change as we move forward. Dr. Schwartzberg, thank you very much. I, I hope you and your family stay very healthy. Thank you, and you and yours as well. Thanks so much. Dr. John Schwartzberg joining us on the show from Cal Berkeley, and believe me, this is, this is something that everybody needs to understand patience. And remember, look for the facts. I want to thank Dr. Schwartzberg. I want to thank our entire staff here. Hang on, because in just a couple of moments, you'll learn where you can hear The Man in the Arena on podcast. And also, don't forget, you can catch us on YouTube as well after the shows are done. For everybody here at The Man in the Arena, for Dr. Schwartzberg, I'm Ed Berliner. Thanks so much for joining us. And please, be safe, wash your hands, and rock on, true believers. For story ideas, comments, start some interesting debates, or just get in touch, join me on social media, at Berliner Speaks, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Also join me on LinkedIn for business and also sponsorship discussions. There you can search out Ed Berliner. A reminder that all of our episodes on Man in the Arena are available on YouTube. Just go to Welcome to the arena.com. Every episode of Man in the Arena is also available on audio podcast on all of the major platforms. This has been a presentation of Entourage Management LLC and Entourage Media.